the Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. Today we are joined by Gloria Negretti McLeod. She's a member of the United States Congress, and it's good to see you. I good recently had you. the honor of interviewing you in Washington, D.C. It was nice seeing you. Absolutely. And I do want to ask you about an issue that was quite prominent in my discussions, and that dealt with immigration reform. Now, when I was speaking with members about immigration reform, this was about a month or so, it seemed as if there was a consensus building amongst Democrats and at least Western state Republicans to get a bill out of the House that would be palatable to all sides. It seems as if that that has hit a bit of a bump. Is that fair to say? Is, that, is my analysis off? Um, I think so. I think it's what people say in their home districts mm. and what they do in the Congress. It's kind of like in Sacramento, what you right. do, what you say. Recently, there was an amendment that passed, and it was sponsored by a congressman from Iowa, Stephen King, who is known for his positions against immigration reform. And it would defund President Obama's Deferred Action Program, which is the Dream Act program, the, 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 which the right, young people, right, which allows those brought to the country without papers as children to avoid deportation. The amendment came to the floor suddenly, it passed, some saw it as a surprise. What's your sense of what this event does in terms of the entire immigration reform debate? Well, we thought that in the Congress, in the House, that we had kind of a consensus that immigration reform is something that, as you said, that mm. everybody was going to push and it was going to, we, we knew that there's going to be people that, that didn't want this particular um, legislation. However, we thought everybody was on board, but when this amendment came on the floor, it was kind of a shock to many people. So thereby, the Democrats all voted no on the amendment. And then when the bill in chief came, which was security, right. uh, then every Democrat voted no. Ultimately, though... Probably almost all. I would right. say almost all. Ultimately, though, the measure in chief passed. Yes. It is a Republican-controlled Congress, House. Uh, presumably, it would go to the Senate, we're not sure what would happen there, but the Democrats do control the Senate. It could wind up uh, at the uh, president's desk. Presumably he would veto it because it defunds a program he supports. That being said, it really begs the question. There seems to be, and this is my personal view, just looking as an outsider, that the Senate, both Democrats and Republicans, are coming to some consensus on immigration reform. Whether they can get to 60 votes, I don't know, as required by filibuster rules. But in the House, the divisions seem mighty. I, it was, it's much larger. It was much larger. Of course, you have 100 people in the Senate. You have 435 now in the Congress. Mm -hmm. So that's a whole lot more people that you have to come over and, and massage and get, get to, to where you come to consensus. When I was speaking with your colleagues on the Republican side of the aisle, many, as I mentioned, Western Republicans, I asked them about the discussions they have in their caucus. Uh, because a lot of members of their caucus will not have communities that are interested in immigration reform, but a lot of Republican members do have significant agriculture interests. And we know that agriculture is increasingly dominated by immigrant labor. And so when you speak with your colleagues on the Republican side about immigration reform, are you able, are they hearing that immigration reform is not just about amnesty, as they may call it, but there's a business side to this issue? I think most Californians mm. will agree that immigration is, is paramount to agriculture in this state. I don't know about any other state, right. but in this state, and I'm sure it's the same in other states, but we rely on, on immigrants to, to do those jobs that a lot of people won't. I want to get a sense from you as well about the border because there is no doubt that to members of both parties, border security is critical. We know that under the 1986 Immigration Reform Act that was passed and signed under the Reagan years, there was a sense that border security wasn't attended to in a, in a proper way. How important is border security becoming as the House looks at immigration reform? Uh, I guess it would depend where you came mm -hmm. from. Mm -hmm. I think the states that are not bordering the border mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. are much more concerned about the border than the people that live along the border. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, California has already done quite a bit on the border, but what the border has done 
uh, trying to enforce that has also caused delays in the commerce that goes back and forth. And you know, San Diego and, and Tijuana are almost like brothers and sisters no, I there. Mean, when and I was some of the ones in Arizona, the, some of the, the cities in, right. in Texas are kind of the same way. Right. I spoke with Susan Davis, one of your colleagues who is very who much, right, who represents San Diego and is very interested in creating those business relationships between the two communities. Speaking of business, if I may, I want to shift gears a bit and talk about health care reform. There's no doubt that what we know as the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare is on its way. I mean, provisions, we are, we, please. By, by October, everybody has to already been signed up. Right. In January of next year, so 2014, right. then the, the whole Health Care Act is implemented. So I'm going to have a workshop in August. Excellent. A, a town hall. Do you know where yet? Not yet. We okay. don't, we're not sure where, no problem. to kind of, all that. so everybody see, all of us, Right. are very excited about this. But ask me how many people have called about this issue. Ask As me. compared to canine issues. Because yes. I think ask, in D.C., yes, how yes. many people have called about the Affordable Care Act? Zero. How and many people have called about concerns about animals? Well, I had not, not too many calls, but we had 3,000 calls about... Calls, calls about the horse meat. Horse meat, right. Yes. Yeah, horse meat. 3,000... Right. On emails, horse meat? On horse meat. And zero on, on the Affordable Care Act. In my district. Right. I don't know about anybody no, else's but, district. But, but that, that says that people are either not paying attention or don't even know what to ask. And of course, you know, each state is responsible for setting up their exchanges. California was way in the avant-garde before anybody else, and we already have exchanges. Cover so, California is off and running. I mean, they, are, they have already found which providers are going to participate. I know they're going to start running ads. And you know the the uh, the chatter out there is that it's going to be out of sight, outrageous. And yet yes. all of the insurance company have put out their data, and it's actually going to be more affordable than what everybody was saying. It's interesting. I have read articles which suggest that overall premiums will go down. I've also seen some analysis which suggests that maybe for young people, premiums could go, could go up. For those that are not young, maybe go down. In uh, order for all of them to stay down, is they're going to have a lot of health. They're going to need a lot of healthy people to join those pools. And let's talk about people joining pools and joining insurance. You represent portions of the Inland Empire. And as you know, the Inland Empire, more than many areas of our great state, suffers from a lack of primary care physicians. Mm -hmm. It's a significant problem. Do you know, I know you're in Washington now, do you know if the state is looking to try to bolster its cadre of primary care physicians? Well, I, I think that's going to be an issue because if we're going to get more people that are going to need insurance, you know, uh, probably almost everybody that has insurance currently they're not going to be affected they will not by be this. Impacted. I've learned that. So they have their primary care physicians. Mm -hmm. I belong to Kaiser, right? So I have Kaiser. So I'm not. I'm not worried about that. Uh, and so, but those people that are going to join that that large Medicaid uh, right. area, the, the expansion, the Medicaid expansion, expansion. Of, mm -hmm. of all of this insurance, they're going to have to have providers. Right. And so, where are we going to get the providers? And you know, when we had our our difficulty here in the state. A whole lot of people didn't want to do it because the Medi-Cal reimbursement rates were so low. Right. A lot of doctors and, 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 and people just dropped out. And right now, I believe that the California reimbursement rate for Medi-Cal is it's 50 still, at that of 50. Mm -hmm. I know there is an effort in Sacramento. You're no yeah. longer there but to the increase price. that with a surplus. It's okay. I, I look on, online I know you every do. day to read all no, of the news. I know you do. So um, given that your constituents seem to be silent, about this question of the Affordable Care but Act. But they're going to have to come on board, right. and so we're going to make as much noise as we possibly can. And they're going to be able to, to access uh, my website so that right. they, they could get information that way. And that's your goal. I follow you on Twitter, and I see you're constantly putting out information yeah. about the Affordable Care Act. Well, we want to make sure people are aware of it, because it's going to hit them like a door hitting them in the face. Literally. And they're going to say, I didn't know this was coming. <laughs> Her name is Gloria Negretti McLeod. She's a member of the United States Congress. My name is Brad Palmer. So we'll be right back on Charter California Edition. In what year did the federal government launch the Medicaid program? 1963, 65, 68, or 1970? Launched in 1965, Medicaid currently covers 60 million Americans a year, costing $500 billion annually. 
Welcome to Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. Our guest, Pete Aguilar. He is the mayor of the city of Redlands, also a candidate for the United States Congress. That election will be held, the primary, in June 2014. Correct. And so I want to start with the city of Redlands, a beautiful city. How is your city doing generally? It's part of the Inland Empire, which has faced some challenges during this economic downturn. A pleasure to be with you, Brad. Please. Um, Redlands is doing incredibly well. We just recently passed uh, another balanced budget, yeah. uh, uh, four balanced budgets in the last five. Even through this global economic right. uh, uh, crisis, you know, we're able to weather the storm and to do well to make the right investments for residents. But also to know at the end of the day, it's about balancing the books. So right. we have a $15 million reserve, uh, nice. which is an incredibly good position for us. Uh, and we're starting to invest in infrastructure, which is important. Residents want to see that improvement. At the same time, cities have faced tremendous struggles vis-a-vis -vis Sacramento. We know that Sacramento Sacramento has taken away various tools that cities have used to try to revitalize certain neighborhoods, be it redevelopment, which was completely eliminated, enterprise zones, which were all but eliminated. So how are cities like Redlands trying to navigate the new landscape without these incentive tools? Well, it's a good question, and you know what we're trying to do is to offer value back to our residents. Um, before, you know, folks might have used redevelopment zones or enterprise zones, as you mentioned. Uh, what we're trying to do is the old-fashioned way. We're trying to save money. Uh, we're trying to ask residents if they will make an investment in our streets and roads. And overwhelmingly, uh, they're supportive of it. Through so, bonds? Or? Uh, yeah, through bonds. Mm -hmm. uh, so $45 million in bonds. Uh, that's paid for by um, an assessment on our solid waste. Um, so the, the taxpayers are paying for this improvement. And we were very honest and said, this is going to cost you $2.68 a month. Are you willing? To do when it. did that pass? Uh, passed, the council passed it and uh, uh, in, last year okay. the program went into effect earlier this year. Oh, so, so it's, so it's, it's going. going. It's going. It's right. going. We've done phase one. We have 11 million dollars of street and road uh, improvement that's going to that's going to start construction in the next couple months. So uh, we're off and running. I want to shift gears and talk about your race for Congress. Uh, you had run in 2012 and through some s electoral challenges you wound up not advancing to the general but you're looking to run again this time around uh, against an incumbent congressman Gary Miller. How's the landscape looking today? The landscape looks good. You know, we're we're focused on representing you know working class families in the region. Uh, I grew up in San Bernardino. Uh, my folks were fourth generation Inland Empire residents. Really, uh, my parents uh, met at uh, San Gregorio High School oh, in my. San Bernardino. So, you know, we have deep roots in the community. And you know, but at its core, what what I noticed was you know Inland Empire families are still struggling. Right. And Congress is so dysfunctional. Folks won't even have a conversation with each other. A and that begs the question. I mean, you could be mayor of Redlands, which seems higher in office and Congressman, as your kids would say to yeah, you. Yeah. So why is it that you do want to advance to an institution whose approval rating is in the teens on a good day? I mean, right. what is it about this institution that, that compels you? Well, at its core, what I try to teach uh, my kids mm. and, and what I try to tell young people is you have to be involved in your community. And I couldn't you know, stand by on the sidelines while people are hurting um, and while uh, we don't have a good voice in Congress who's willing to work together to solve the bigger issues uh, for our region and for this country. I couldn't stand by. And what are the issues that you hear are at the top of mind for the residents of your congressional district? It's, it's jobs in the economy, mm -hmm. uh, education, uh, how do we ensure that our young people are going to have an opportunity, a path uh, to go to school, um, but also there, there's challenges. Um, comprehensive immigration reform um, is, an, is an incredible yeah. uh, and, option and opportunity that we have for our young people. And I want to talk about immigration sure. reform because it is a very significant issue in California, in inland California especially. And uh, I was recently in Washington. I had the honor to interview several members of Congress. And I did not have a chance to meet uh, Mr. Miller, who's the incumbent congressman. But I did speak with both Democrats and Republicans. And in California, at least, it seems as if there's, there's unified support behind the idea of immigration reform. But when I spoke with members of Congress outside of the Southwest, you just don't hear that. Right. They're not compelled by the desire to fix what's seen as a broken system. So where do we go from here? I mean, should you be victorious, anything could happen, but likely would join a minority party, meaning Democrats would likely sure. not take the majority. So what do you do in that scenario? 
Well, you continue to advocate and you continue to educate uh, your residents. And, you know, if this is an important issue to our communities, it's incumbent upon, you know, our residents and constituents to let their member of Congress know. Unfortunately, because of the way, you know, seats have been drawn throughout right. the nation, you know, sometimes Democrats are in very, very safe seats and Republicans are in very, very safe seats. Uh, and, and that creates a little bit of the echo chamber. And that's, uh, that doesn't give uh, some members of Congress the ability to, to, to make a vote that they probably know is right. And, well, and that's the unfortunate thing. And what's so interesting, though, is that in California, we do see that it would appear some level bipartisan support behind immigration reform, but despite the fact we're the largest delegation in the Congress, we're stalled. I mean, as we right. speak today, passed out of the Senate with right. it, almost 70 votes, right. and yet in the House, it, it, it's just limping along. Cal California can lead the way again. Right. And if our members of Congress, both Democrats and Republicans, all stand up and say, this is important for our country, this is important for our economy, uh, you know, their colleagues will take notice. The problem is, some members of Congress still haven't taken a position, right. and some are in these listening tours and right. phases, and some have taken very polarizing positions um, that have been anti-immigrant positions, opposed right. to the 14th Amendment, birthplace citizenship. Right. Those are things that, that our communities are, you know, they want to move and beyond. In San Bernardino County, the district in which you seek to represent, are people talking to you about immigration? Is it an issue that's at the top of mind, or is it still jobs, economy, housing rebound? No, it's an issue that's at top of mind. Uh -huh. But but I, I I would say it from the context as well that you know some of our young people, uh, some folks who are, are children right. of immigrants, you know, right now they feel that they can't come out of the shadows, right. and the Dream Act did not pass. Right. We have many member, uh, a friend of mine, Marina at Cal State San Bernardino, I recently talked to, and you know she told me her parents are afraid to attend civic and political functions because you know they're afraid that a member of their family isn't going to come home with them right. and those these are the things that we can solve that's w what our focus should be uh, University of Redlands right in the heart of your district a private institution and we know there's been a lot of contention in Congress relating to loans student loans and I'm wondering since you do represent you would represent Redlands is that something that folks are talking about this debate about whether the government should be looking at student loans and providing certain incentives to create a low uh, loan interest rate. As someone who's still paying off their ah, student loans. Did you go to Redlands? Uh, yeah, I went to okay, Redlands and I'm it. still paying off my right, student right, loans. Right, right, uh, right. But uh, obviously when I, when I talk to young people, it is something that they're aware of. And, and the fact that these um, uh, student loan rates could go up, uh, are going up right. now that that, that is law, um, and this, the ceiling that is being used is higher than the previous ceiling, you know, that's going to hurt students. Is it, is it going to hurt them today? day? You know, maybe not, but it could hurt the decisions that they make uh, seeking higher, uh, whether they choose to go beyond uh, their undergraduate studies. I want to talk about hard, raw politics. You know this as well as I do. The district with which you seek to represent is seen as the number one pickup target for Democrats in the entire nation. That's there right. are 435 seats. The district with which you seek to represent is the number one pickup target for Democrats. You're a Democrat. What kind of pressure does that put on you? I mean, in the one on the one hand, it seems like an admirable position, but on the other hand, I mean, every article I read, it's always talking about the Miller Aguilar race. I mean, that's <laughs> that's what I see. I mean, it doesn't matter right. what report you look at. Well, the good news for us, I think, in this region is it's going to highlight the issues that are important to our communities, uh, okay. like we talked about jobs, the econ the economy, comprehensive immigration reform. The residents and, and the communities that we live in deserve their representatives and those seeking office right. to take positions on these issues. So, you know, what I'm excited about uh, is it a little bit of pressure? Of course, it is. Uh, I'm, I'm someone who grew up in the region. <laughs> And, and, and I want to represent this region, but uh, you know I take uh, I take delight and, and I'm excited about this step. I'm excited about talking about right. the issues that affect our communities. But that means that you're getting a lot of national attention, and so it also means that you're getting a lot of um, interests. And I don't mean this pejoratively, contacting you, donating money to you because you're seen as a hope for Democratic Party interests. How do you navigate that? It's not just this little congressional seat. I mean, right. you, you have the National Party looking at you. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a right. lot. It's a lot. It but, is. But, you know, we're excited about it because this gives us an opportunity in a forum to talk about the things that we've done in Redlands. When people want to know, you know, what my mindset is, we work together in the Redlands City Council. Uh, we don't run with party labels. We get things done. Okay. We balance budgets. We solve problems. His name is Pete Aguilar. He is the mayor of Redlands. He's a candidate for the United States Congress. My name is Brad Palmer. So we'll be right back on Charter California Edition. Since the Civil War, how many times has the president's party 
gain seats in the United States Congress in midterm elections. Three, five, seven, or nine. The president's party has picked up seats in Congress only three times since the Civil War in midterm elections, 1934, 1998, and 2002. Welcome back. It's Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. Our guest is Adam Rush. He is the mayor pro tem of the city of Eastvale in Riverside County, one of the newest cities in our state. And many new cities have faced tremendous challenges yes. as a result of some changes in funding formulas coming out of Sacramento. What's the update with regard to the funding formula? And I'm looking at the question about vehicle license fees and how that money had been pulled from new cities. Correct. Well, that was one of the primary sources of income that new cities rely on to become an incorporated city. And when that was pulled out from under us, there was a, a lot of concern. We've passed through all the committees in the Senate and the Assembly, and basically we're just waiting for it to come to a floor vote. We expect that to happen sometime in September. So right now we're in a hover period, and we're going to see in the next couple months hopefully next month if it does get right. passed, and then it goes back to the governor for signature. But, we're, but we've been here before. Yes. I mean, as I recall, it passed in another legislative session, and the governor vetoed, is he that did. correct? He did veto it based upon his concerns on the impact of realignment. Right. And so given that the state is in better, better uh, fiscal shape, mm -hmm. do you have a sense, a feeling that maybe this time around the VLF money will be restored? Our feelers from you know, the best that I can describe it from the governor's uh, Department of Finance are positive, mm. but they are still holding things very close to the chest and they won't give us a lot of information. So how is your city surviving without that money? Because as I understand it, that money really was the lion's share of these new cities' budgets. Correct, it was about 30% of our budget when it was taken away, business development and economic development. I attended a ribbon cutting today for uh, the Ulta makeup store. I guess mm -hmm. they're the number four tax uh, generator in Victoria Gardens in Rancho Cucamonga. Oh, wow. So we have them, and we're just doing everything we can with the limited resources to bring new businesses to Eastvale. But that being said, things are looking bright. Uh, you know, since the last time we talked, I mean, I was thinking, boy, this city's not going to make it. We heard rumors about disincorporation, be it Eastvale, Harupa, mm -hmm. Menifee, whatever it was. But I look, you, you passed a balanced budget. There are some infrastructure improvements marching along. What's gone right? Correct. Correct. Well, it's mostly been a perfect storm of a lot of things going right. Uh, Very and a good perfect storm. Yeah, a good perfect storm. Very fortunately. It's just fiscal uh, responsibility and making sure that we squeeze every dollar out of everything. We still only have five full-time employees and we're doing all of this with such a limited staff. So. But is it also that the economy is turning around and the Inland Empire is the beneficiary of that improving economy? Because ultimately, so. as I understand it, cities receive a good chunk of their revenue from sales tax. Yes. And so if you have sales tax increasing, you're gonna be in better shape. We will. We, and we and are. You, are you? Correct. Yes, we are. Uh, our sales tax has increased, and part of that equation has been approximately 380 new homes that have been built just this year. In, in Eastvale. In Eastvale. And so we're developing more, and that's bringing more people to spread the wealth with respect to uh, providing more sales tax revenue for the city. So that's been a huge benefit as well. So where, as we speak today, where do we stand? Do we feel as if that Eastvale the worst is behind the city and whether VLF passes or not, smooth sailing ahead or at least... No, it's not smooth sailing. It's something that we still have to continue to fight for. We have a balanced budget right now, and but we're still in this year-to-year -year quandary. Getting the VLF will really solidify our future for the next 10 years, and that's how we see it. Talk to me about the infrastructure improvements because you sent me some pictures. Hopefully they're on the screen right now. I mean, I was stumped. I was literally stumped when I saw this. I said, how could this be happening? I mean, this is a city that can barely survive. Yeah. No criticism intended, but yeah. how is it happening? Well, it's happening by that business development model, bringing in new home builders and new retail developers, and they're footing the bill for a lot of that infrastructure. Is it that it's part of the fees that they pay Correct. to get the permit, so that money can be dedicated to infrastructure improvements? Correct. So yeah. give us an example. I mean, I, this is a statewide program, but still give us mm -hmm. a sense of what's happening in, yeah. your, in, your, in well, your city. Well, we're working on uh, bridge expansion over the Santa Ana River. We're working on you know several 
road improvements to try to get people on and off the road quicker and we're looking at building a brand new fire station so it'll be our second fire station we've only been incorporated three years how large is the city 14 square miles, 56,000 residents. Okay, so 14 square miles is a, is a pretty good distance. It is. Yeah, it's not as if you're, you're compacted. Correct. Um, also, I wanna, you mentioned fire station, and I want to get a sense about priorities. Mm -hmm. Because when you do have tight budgets, it's, it's a tricky situation. What do you spend your money upon? Is it infrastructure? Is it police and fire? Where are you looking Correct. on that front? Well, our number one priority is always going to be public safety. And that's why we've, we've done in a fiscal manner in a responsible manner but we've been able to add to our fire and our police public safety through our contracts with the county of riverside and through a lot of those fees that have come in but interestingly when for those that aren't familiar with east vale it, it's a nice area i mean it it's is. not as if you're it, it's a challenged community in terms of gang infestation or whatever it is so of course obviously public safety is paramount but yeah. I mean, it's a pretty well-heeled community. Well, so. thank goodness we don't have you know those substantial problems. Right. But we also have to counter that a very high quality of life and a very high expectation. Uh. Individuals move from some of those more dilapidated areas in LA and Orange County, mm -hmm. and they expect sometimes near perfection. And so it's providing the services to uh, make sure that you know they have spent. Three, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars on a home to live in a in a safe community in a quiet community. So, those things that normally wouldn't bother uh, individuals living in other areas sure. tend to bother new residents in Eastvale. And Eastvale is also known for outstanding schools. Yes. What school district services Eastvale? Corona Norco. Okay, so we know Corona Norco has been a strong school district for quite some time. Give us a sense of how well the schools are uh, in the Eastvale community. Yeah. Well, in the last three years, it's just skyrocketed. They recently won an award for closing the achievement gap mm -hmm. in the district. Uh, we have a brand new intermediate school that is as high tech as high tech can be. And with all you know, the scores coming in uh, from the state standards and the federal standards, most of, I think all of the Eastville schools are at or above meeting those standards. And, and that's driven the residential boom, that's driven the economic boom. People want to come to Eastvale. Now the only bad problem is the schools are starting to get impacted. They're starting to bus kids around and put up modules which we don't want to mm. see. So we're looking now to how do we build more schools and the district is actually looking at building more schools than they originally planned. Really? Yes. I want to get a sense from you about the, the new sister cities, mm -hmm. Harupa, Wildemar, Menifee, I'm sure that you're all friends, you yes. know, you're kind of misery loves company, although I don't want to suggest it's all bad, but from what you know, how are those cities faring? I think we're fairly synonymous with Menifee. Mm -hmm. We, they're much larger than we are, about three times the size of us, but they have a good diversified housing and mm -hmm. uh, sales tax base. And then I, I grew up Harupa and Wildemar kind of in the other category. They're more rural environments. Uh, they have an older population. And they, unfortunately, were hit much harder with the VLF. Why? Um, why? Because they have a larger area to cover from a police and fire. That VLF goes almost directly to pay for public safety. That's why it not only was a financial impact, but just really kind of we felt stabbed in the back by the state because it's money that we pay to put cops on the street. And that was, you know, a lot of the fervor that is still... Um, kind of burning inside us to get this fixed because that helps public safety. We don't spend that on events or conferences right. or, or building. We spend that on boots on the ground. So, so what you've described is what I've heard as well, that Harupa uh, and Wildemar are facing tremendous challenges. They are. Do we have a sense? I mean, these are all, it's all speculation. Mm -hmm. Where are we, where they go from here? Um, we don't have a clear sense, and if they were to disincorporate and not become a city, mm -hmm. then it would be back on the county, right. back to provide services, because there's residents in the cities that need services one way or the right. other, and that might affect the greater whole. So um, I think they're you know, sometimes on the cusp and they're sometimes doing better. Um, the VLF, and that is our main Right. priority is to get it for them. It's going to benefit us, but to get it back for them so they can survive. No, so. I hear you. Okay, his name is Adam Rush. He is a member of the city council in the beautiful city of Eastvale. He is mayor pro tem. My name is Brad Palmer. And this is Charter California Edition.